Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 269. And this time I'm going to talk about this terrific effort by Charles Mingus from 1960 on Atlantic Blues and Roots. This is a 1976 Japanese press, which apparently cost 1,800 yen. This is one of Charles Mingus's more accessible records, provided you have at least some degree of tolerance for shouting and a little bit of cacophony. It is brilliant and witty, like almost all of his compositions. It's also the culmination of a momentous decade for Mingus, which he starts in around 1950 as a postal worker who's basically given up on his jazz career, and he ends at the end of the decade basically sitting on top of the jazz mountain. He's critically acclaimed, but there is also a strain of dissent. People saying this stuff is brilliant. It's the work of genius, but it doesn't all swing. So what he does here is a sharp right turn down to New Orleans, down to the Mississippi Delta, reaching back to the blues and to the origins of jazz to produce a record which is fundamentally grounded in historical black music. By 1959, Charles Mingus had been working for quite a while in larger groups, that is to say, bigger than the typical hard bop combos of between three and six. He's dealing with groups of, say, seven, eight, nine, ten people. The workshop idea had germinated with Mingus as early as 1943, when he was still living in L.A. Uh, he'd had a few tastes of success, or at least exposure to success, playing, for instance, with Louis Armstrong, and he was studying music at Los Angeles City College. The college's music program had a dedicated workshop for classical musicians and composers, and Mingus felt that might actually work also in the less structured, more improvisational world of jazz. At that time, however, he never really got a chance to put that into practice, because despite a short stint with Lionel Hampton later in the 40s, his career basically hits the skids, and by the time you get to 48, 49, he figures the jig's up, he's abandoned pursuing music full-time, and he's got a job at the post office. His fortunes quickly took a turn upwards, however, because Red Norvo, the vibraphonist, was moving from New York to L.A. at the time. He had a sustained engagement at The Hague. He had a guitarist in tow, Tal Farlow, but he didn't have a bass player. And someone said, what about the guy that you once played with? Which, of course, was Mingus. So they connect, and Mingus plays with Norvo and Farlow for several years. They end up moving back to New York. But it all comes to grief in 1953 when a TV producer puts pressure on Norvo not to have Mingus be on a TV spot and to bring in a white bass player instead. And Mingus understandably says, I'm out of here. So he's now in his own, but Mingus was always a self-starter. And at this point, after a couple of years in New York, he had a pretty good network. He'd also started his own label, Debut Records, which was giving him additional profile. Around that time, too, Mingus begins to start to pull together the jazz workshop concept that he'd had in mind for about a decade. He starts to organize these concerts, basically styled as workshops, at the Putnam Central Club in Brooklyn. And with his reputation growing in New York, the quality of drop-ins that he would get in these workshop dates were pretty high quality. People like Monk, Art Blakey, and Max Roach. This whole concept starts to resonate with the jazz community in New York, and one of the spin-offs that happened is something called the Jazz Composers Workshop, which Mingus was central to, and there's one record that comes out of that. But Mingus ultimately came to feel that that was trying to mix two things that didn't really mix very well, formal composition and jazz. And he came to understand and believe quite strongly that jazz itself was not particularly amenable to anything resembling formal composition, because if people actually played formal compositions as they were written down, they lost all the spontaneity. But on top of that, you couldn't get real jazz players to follow the notes that were written down on a page in the first place. They always wanted to improvise, and they needed to be allowed to do that. So he doesn't lose a focus on composition, but he begins to do so in a way meant to serve jazz and serve jazz musicians. So there are chord progressions, there are suggested notes, but there's also clarity around the fact there's a wide degree of latitude for improvisation. This vision of his, which also sees him introducing political ideas, subtle or not so subtle, into his compositions, really starts to get worked out on the bandstands of New York, Greenwich Village, so on, in the 1950s. Things like Mingus of the Bohemia really captures quite well compositions like Haitian Fight Song. You can hear it on Pithecanthropus erectus, his fantastic record on Atlantic from 1956, and on The Clown from 1957. And in all these recordings, Mingus's music is clever, it's aware, it's thoughtful, but it's never planned out or controlling. There's always an element of chaos and unpredictability to it. And it's around this point, 55, 56, 57, that he begins to attract players who would form a major part of his work going forward, some, in fact, for the rest of his life, people who would form key parts of his workshop, and those include people like the saxophonist Shappi Hadi, the drummer Danny Richmond, Pepper Adams, 
Jackie Bayard, John Handy, whom Mingus had met in 1958 during a gig at the Five Spot, the trombonist Jimmy Nepper, the pianist Mal Waldron, another pianist Horace Parlin, whom Mingus had met back in Pittsburgh and who had had a chance meeting with Mingus when Parlin himself moved to New York and talked himself into a job, the saxophonist Booker Irvin, who was a friend of Parlin's and whom Parlin basically roped into working with Mingus. And many of these players were relative unknowns prior to their association with Mingus and basically made their names in his company. Now, the high water mark for this particular period of his career is commonly thought to be the album Mingus Um from 1959. I think is a strong case to be made for this record, which is released afterwards in 1960, but is actually made a few months before. This record is made on one day, February 4th, 1959, at Atlantic Records Studios in New York City, and Nasui Erdogan is the producer. 1959 is a big moment in jazz. The free jazz revolution is happening with Ornette Coleman coming into town. The modal jazz revolution is happening with Miles Davis taking his relatively cerebral approach to jazz composition. There is, of course, the overwhelming fact of the civil rights movement and all of the reaction to that in many U.S. states at the time. This is a real time of ferment, and this record is a reaction to a number of those pieces. First, it was a rejection of free jazz, which Mingus either thought was something shallow and unreplicable and really not worthy of the name jazz, or, at other times, something which was worth doing, which he could do better. Secondly, it was also a reaction against what he saw, and critics at the time, some of them anyway, saw as well, as jazz's drift away from its links with historical black music, which Mingus saw as a bit of a betrayal, again, given the civil rights context and the importance of celebrating blackness at this time. But finally, third, it's also a reaction against those critics who had been saying of Mingus that his own music didn't swing, and so, of course, this is implicitly a criticism that he himself is drifting away from black music. So he makes a record which is fundamentally about those historical linkages. He's determined to show everybody that he had not forgotten where he came from. Mingus is on bass, and he's joined by nine other performers, most, if not all, of whom were routine workshop collaborators. On alto sax, you've got John Handy and Jackie McLean. On tenor sax, Booker Irvin and on baritone sax, Pepper Adams. The work of these four is remarkable, not just because of the quality of their solos, but because when they transition from one player to another, you often find yourself, at least I do, having to remind yourself, wait a minute, this is somebody different playing now, and actually it's a whole different instrument playing now. Such is the seamless way that they manage that. The two trombonists are Jimmy Nepper and Willie Dennis. On drums is Danny Richmond, the loyal Danny Richmond, and then on piano, Horace Parlin handles most of it, but on one track, E's flat, Oz flat two, is Mel Waldron. Side one starts with Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting, a classic Mingus track, and right away you're into that wonderful organized chaos of a typical Mingus record. Next is Cryin' Blues, which is one for the bass solo appreciation crowd, of which I count myself a member, and Parlin's bluesy solo is also an excellent part of this track. The final track on side one, Monin, is not the Art Blakey tune, it's an original by Mingus. This has got three remarkable contributions by the saxophonist. Side two starts with tensions, on which you have this really cool head arrangement where both trombones and I think one of the saxes as well are all playing in unison. And what's really great about this track in particular is, as I mentioned before, that seamless transition in the solos from one horn to another, not just the saxophones, but I think also the trombones as well. My Jelly Roll Soul, of course, refers to Jelly Roll Morton, of whom Mingus was a huge fan. Mingus had, in fact, planned to do a whole album of arrangements of Jelly Roll Morton tunes, but lost the book, apparently, in which he'd written down these arrangements, so this has to suffice. Lots of great reasons to love this track, too. My personal favorite part is this percussive style that Mingus uses on the bass. Finally, we have E's flat, Oz flat two, and this is the one where Waldron comes in for Parlin. I don't quite find this song at the same level as the other tracks on here, but it's still really, really tight ensemble playing. This record may not have the sheer diversity, brilliance, and craziness of Mingus Ah Um, or the wilder frontiers of the Black Saint and the Sinner Lady, but I think that's kind of the point, too. Mingus wanted to show the world that he could still swing and play the blues, and he does that very entertainingly over all six tracks. It's still a Mingus record, and it's kind of this element of like you're watching a parade and a float's going by and a bunch of people on the float have been thrown instruments and they just picked them up and started playing. But that playing is consistently brilliant and particularly on here from Jackie McLean and Booker Urban. I think this is one of Mingus's great records and I give it five out of five.